even now, Lord Jesus, for I ask this in your name, amen. To President Aiken, one of the greatest gifts that the Lord has given me in these 74 years. Thank you, my brother. I, I didn't persevere. I had the pleasure of reading your work, learned much from it, and I'm glad to see the fruit of it. This is home for me. It's a blessing to be here. So many people that uh, I have the privilege of um, renewing uh, our relationship just by being here. I'm going to break a homiletical rule and read a half a passage and by the Spirit of God treat the uh, passage in its entirety. Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Psalm 116. What shall I render? Psalm 116. I'm beginning verse 12 and reading to verse 19. I'm reading from the King James Version of the English Bible that was good enough for Paul and Silas and good enough for the Hebrew <laughs> children, good enough for my mother and father, and is good enough for me. Psalm 116, verse 12. Hear these words from the word. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. To God, who owns everything and owes nothing, we as believers who own nothing and owe everything must render unto him in the spirit of Christ thanksgiving for all his benefits. To God, who owns everything and owes nothing, we as believers must render unto him thanksgiving for all of his benefits, for we own nothing and know everything. Let's say this together, if this makes sense to you. To God, who owns everything and owes nothing, we as believers who own nothing and owe everything must render unto him in the spirit of Christ, thanksgiving for all of his benefits. What happens when an irresistible force meets an immovable object? That's too abstract. Let me concretize it. What happens when a spear that is irresistible meets a shield that is impenetrable. Physics will tell you it's an impossibility because if the spear is irresistible, the shield cannot be impenetrable. And if the shield is impenetrable, then the spear cannot be irresistible. It's a scientific and a realistic impossibility. But that's exactly what the psalmist lifts up as a scenario for us today, an impossibility and yet a, a realism that we must attend to. The psalmist takes and establishes an impossibility of paying God back for all of his benefits, while at the same time evoking 
the necessity of praising God at the same time. He establishes the impossibility of paying God back for all of his benefits, and yet makes it a necessity to praise God for all that he has done for us. In Romans chapter 11, verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are inscrutable. His ways are past finding out. So we're already at a loss. You can't research him. You can't exhaust him in terms of your, your knowledge. His ways are already past finding out. Then he goes on to verse 34. Who has known the mind of God and who has been his counselor? Who can crawl up into the cranium of Yahweh and know his mind? What psychiatrist, what counselor do you know that has had God to lie down on his counseling couch and receive counsel from a human? No one. Then he goes on to tell us, and who has loaned God anything and God is in debt to pay him back? It's an impossibility. So he takes and establishes the impossibility of paying God back. And yet, he evokes the necessity of praise at the same time. Verse 6, 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. For him all glory be to him forever. We cannot pay God back for what God has done. And yet... It is imperative that we praise God with what God has loaned out to us. Paul takes us to Romans, or rather to 1 Corinthians 1, 25. And he raises um, what would be considered absurd. 1 Corinthians 1, 25. The... Foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. And the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of humans. It's absurd. God at his most foolish level, and it's a struggle for me to say it that way, but I'm just listening to what Paul is saying because Paul is positing something that is ridiculous and absurd. And if it could be real, then God is wiser in his foolishness than we are with our highest GPAs. And God is stronger in his weakness than we are in our strength. So we always push back. Hmm. He is establishing the possibility of paying God back for anything God has done. And yet Paul takes and moves even further to 1 Corinthians 4 and 7 and says, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you don't have anything that you didn't receive, why are you boasting? Which really means that whatever you have, God gave it to you. And it is a necessity to take what God has given to you to offer praise and thanksgiving to God. So you're only giving back God to God what God has given to you. And therefore, we have no reason to boast. In fact, praise is not an option. Praise is a necessity. He brings us to the very border of the ridiculous in Psalm 50, verse number 12. And God says, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The same God who feeds the birds, the beasts, the bugs, the same God who feeds everyone. If God ever got hungry and we can't have anything without him because everything we have comes from him, we'd be in deep trouble. And God says, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. And the, Psalm, the, the, the brothers just got finished singing Psalm 150. Verse number six, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You know where breath comes from? In fact, blow your hand a moment. Everybody do this. Now, if you don't feel anything, you're in the wrong place. There's some undertakers around here that would 
come get you. That means when I feel breath, it's borrowed breath. And the breath I have, I must use to give glory to God. So to God who owns everything and owes nothing, we who own nothing and know everything must render unto him in the spirit of Christ thanksgiving for all of his benefits. Those of us who are house owners know that we have to pay um, interest and eventually get to the principal and pay that off. You and I will never be able to make a bona fide interest payment on God. I'm always behind on my Thanksgiving. I'm always in arrears on my Thanksgiving because when I want to make an interest payment, he gives me another 1,000 blessings today. And I'm always behind. I can't keep up with what he is doing. When upon life's billows you are tempest taught, when you feel discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. When waves of affliction sweep over the soul and sunlight is hidden from view, whenever you tempted to fret or complain, just think of his goodness to you. Just think of his goodness to you. Just think of his goodness to you. Those storms or you sweep, he is able to keep. Just think of his goodness to you. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits? Because what I have received from him, I must give back to him in praise and adoration. How much is too much to render to the Lord? If you could pay him back, what would be too much? In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, the United Market Monarchy is divided. Two tribes now have Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigning. The other ten tribes have Jeroboam reigning over. The northern kingdom, Jeroboam. The southern kingdom, Rehoboam. It is Jeroboam who gets insecure about the people going to Jerusalem, his people, the ten tribes, to Jerusalem for the three annual feasts, the Feast of the Passover, the Feast of Booth, the Feast of Pentecost. He's afraid that they're going to go to Rehoboam's church. So he says in verse 28, and it's a question, isn't it too much for you to go all the way down to Jerusalem to offer your sacrifices and to worship? I'm going to make it convenient for you. I'm going to build a shrine in the north in Bethel, or rather in Dan, and one in the south in Bethel. And I'm going to say, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt, which is the very same phrase that's used in Exodus 32, around verse 8, when the assistant pastor Aaron, the brother of Moses, made golden calves for the Israelites because Moses had been with God too long, 40 long days up on Mount Sinai. And the people went up to Dan and down to Bethel because it was too much to go to Jerusalem every year. How much is too much to give back to God? How much is too much to invest in God? This rich young ruler, whether he was young, this rich ruler, in Mark chapter 10, verse 21 and 22, Jesus looked at him. The Bible says Jesus loved him. And Jesus uh, listened to him. He wanted to know what it would take to inherit eternal life, etc. Jesus told him, and the young man said, I've kept these commandments from my youth up. And then Jesus hit him where his problem was. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and take up your cross and come and follow me. And the Bible says he walked away sorrowfully 
from Jesus because he had many possessions. He walked away from joy sorrowfully because you can't walk away from joy joyfully. He walked away sorrowfully. Not so much because he had many possessions, but the possessions had him. It was too much for him to obey and follow the Lord wholeheartedly. But it's never too much for Jesus. Do you hear what Paul says in Romans 8, 32? God, who spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, shall he not with him freely, graciously give us all things? He gave everything up for us. It was not too much. And for Jesus, it was not too much. We hear these words in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, though being equal with God, counted not robbery, a thing to be grasped, to remain in that position, but emptied himself and became a man and took on the flesh and became a servant and was obedient to God. Obedient like one has never seen obedience and died the most ignominious and shameful and painful death on the cross. And God highly exalted him and gave him a name which was above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow and things of heaven, things of earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It was not enough, it was not too much for him to leave the shining coast of glory and to sit and to wash the feet of his servants. How much is too much for you? How much is too much for me? When it comes to praise, is it too much to praise God from the head down, not just from the neck up? Where you praise and worship God wholeheartedly with all your being, that you have not come to an event. You've come to have an experience. You've come to have an encounter with God. And it doesn't matter what other people are doing. You know what God has done for you and whatever it takes, you offer that to God. You're not trying to fit into a mold of a tradition. You're trying to allow yourself to be free enough to do what Jesus says. They who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. How much is too much to preach with excellence? Oh, people ask me all the time, how long did it, prepare, did it take for you to prepare that sermon? I said 55 years. Sometimes it may mean you get little sleep. You want to preach with excellence? You're not just trying to do enough. You are pouring your whole self into that text. And you go in with the thought of God giving you what you need. And you come out and preach until you're empty. You leave it all in the pulpit. Everything you have, you give to God. How much is too much to pursue theological education? It ain't. And I know how to say it is not. But mama said, ain't. I'm saying it. It ain't about getting a degree. We are dying by degrees. Degrees don't preach. Degrees are on the wall and they yellow after time. That's not what preaches. You preach. And God wants you to give everything you have to your Greek, to your Hebrew, to your languages, to your theology. You're not trying to pass tests. You are a steward. Therefore, you're giving back to God what God has given to you so that you are showing yourself to prove unto God work men and work women that do not need to be ashamed because you're rightly dividing the word of truth. How much is too much to tell somebody about Jesus? Now, as Peter will say in Acts 4 and 20, we cannot help but to speak, he and John. We cannot help but to speak the things we have seen and heard. We got to can't help us. What we've seen and heard. Now, if you haven't seen anything, don't say anything. 
If you haven't heard anything, don't say anything. If the Lord hadn't done anything for you, don't say anything. Uh, but if the Lord has done something for you, if he's blessed your soul, if he's put your name on the roll, if he's brought you out, if he's made a way when there was no way, as if, if he's been a God who's opened up the Red Sea's a possibility for you, you ought to get to can't help us. I can't help myself to tell you, that makes it a difference how fashionable this place is. I'm standing before God that sits in the grandstand of heaven, and I want to represent him and let you know that he's a great God. What's too little, too much to give to this God? Nothing. Psalm 116 in verses 1 to 4, we are confronted with a God who is a God who brings us through and grants us mercy. Verse number 1, I love the Lord for he has inclined his ear. He has heard me and given me mercy. I thank God for mercy. I have to have mercy because justice wants to cut me down. God is a God of justice. In fact, justice and mercy are two sides of the same divine coin of God. When justice comes my way, mercy blocks justice. I can't explain it, but that's it because justice is what I do deserve and mercy is what God gives me in order that justice may not take me out. So here comes justice, and mercy blocks justice, and mercy absorbs justice because Jesus absorbed justice. What was meant for me, Lord help me today, what was meant for me, mercy will absorb it. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that he who knew no sin became sin that we who are sinners might be made the righteous of God. So the reason why you are here today is when uh, you deserve justice because the soul that sins, it shall die. You deserve justice, Robert Smith, because you, pit, you, you, serve, you serve in such a way that the penalty would come upon you. But when justice came, mercy stepped in and allowed our golden moments to roll down just a little while longer. We're confronted with a God who grants us Mercy. Verses 5 through 7. We are confronted with a God who protects and guards. Verse number 6 says, He guards the inexperienced. The inexperienced. When I look back on my life and my ministry and see all the mistakes I've made because of inexperience and ignorance, and God guarded me. God kept me. God held me. Do you know what it's like to look back over your life? You don't have to be as old as I am and realize how inexperienced you were and yet God still blessed you and God still used you and God continued to elevate you and lift you up so that you can lift him up higher and you want to give God praise for being a God who protects and guards. In verses 8 through 11, he's a God who rescues. He says, you have rescued me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I knew a pastor, and I've had members like this. This particular member could not pronounce the word resuscitation and called it rescue station, rescue station. Well, I like that because God is a rescue station. He rescues us. He has rescued me from death. I know what it's like to be diagnosed with cancer three times. I know what it's like to have a stroke twice and on and on and on and on and on. But God had a purpose and God wants me to fulfill that purpose and I want to fulfill it. So he rescues me from death. Is there anybody here? You know that in high school, you were voted the most likely not to succeed. 
And you know that there have been some instances in which you could have been a statistic. You could have died in a car accident. All kinds of things could have happened, but he rescued you and has kept you from falling. He's a rescue station. He also rescues my eyes from incessant tears and my feet from stumbling. We are confronted with a God who protects and guards. In verses 12 through 14, it is now our time to respond because it's impossible to pay God back for all he's done, but there is the necessity of praising God simultaneously. Verses 12 through 14, in verse number 13, he says, I'm going to offer up the cup of salvation. Now it's my turn. It's my response. We have to respond to what God has done. It is the indicative what God has done for us, but it's the imperative what we must say and do in response to God. I'm going to offer up the cup of salvation. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, God makes these statements. I will deliver Israel from bondage in Egypt. They'd been there 400 years, and he did. I will deliver Israel from the, the brutal treatment that they received from the Egyptians, making brick without straw. I will be Israel's God, and they will be my people. And they do become his people. All of these I wills, around the Passover table, they would repeat Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. The I wills, what God said he was going to do. There Jesus sitting with his disciples, and there is the wine with ingredients mixed in, and they're drinking this cup, first cup, second cup, third cup. But the fourth cup, Jesus says in Matthew 26, 29, I will not drink of this cup until I drink it in my Father's kingdom. That's the fourth cup. Hmm. He will drink a cup which will not just be death. No. Because every time Jesus met death, death died. That wasn't the problem. When he went to the Nain Cemetery and saw the little boy in the coffin, he touched the coffin beer and said, get up, young man, and death died. When he went to Jairus' house and his little daughter at 12 years of age had died, he said, Talitha Cooney, I say, arise, young girl, and she rose, arose, and death died. And he waited until Lazarus was dead four days. And he called out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came skipping across the beaches of the Bethany Cemetery like a schoolboy on a college campus, and death died. It wasn't about death. It was about that rift, that separation between God, his Father, and himself. Jesus was bearing sin, even though he never committed any sin, and that was what was dreaded. But one of these days, the fourth cup will be turned up by our Lord, and he will drink that cup. I will take the cup of salvation. And that's what you do. You take the cup of salvation. This is a response to what God has done to you, for you. James and Paul are titans, but they're not opponents. James is an apostle. Works. Paul, an apostle of grace, they are not antithetical at all. You have to have it in a sanctified sequence. It's grace first. We are saved by grace. Mm. And works follow it. As a result of what God has done, this is what God has us to do. It's what John Calvin once said, that good works do not produce salvation. Salvation produces good works. I don't work to be saved. I work because I am saved. I don't work for salvation. I work from salvation. Therefore, you and I, though it's an impossibility to pay God back for what he has done, it's a necessity to praise him for what he has done with what he has given us. 
breath to give him praise from our lips and from our heart. But then in verses 15 to 19, particularly verse number 17, there is this sacrifice of thanksgiving that he offers. I am going to offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Where? In the temple. With whom? In the midst of the congregation. Where? At Jerusalem. Now I know that live streaming has become very popular. And that's fine. But live streaming was never intended to be a necessity, but an accompaniment to in presence as it relates to worship. We've got to the place now, live streaming, in pajamas and gowns, eating bacon and eggs and toast and so forth. That's supposed to be an accompaniment to lie to live services. It's one thing watching a game on the television, football game, basketball. It's another thing being in the stadium. You can't get from live streaming as far as a worship service what you get coming to the house of the Lord. Whatever happened to Psalm 122 verse 1? I was glad when they said unto me, come, let's go to the house of the Lord. Whatever happened to Hebrews 10, 25? Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a man of some is. You can't get from live streaming what you get when you come at the altar and bow down to someone you don't know and yet that's your brother and sister and get up and hug each other and tears come down each other's eyes and get on one another. You can't get the same relationship, the koinonia, the fellowship that you get in church. I think it's time for us to come back to church. I think it's time for us to realize that when we get to heaven, there won't be live streaming. When we get to heaven, we'll sit by the streams and praise God with one another. I'm going to take and offer up the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now, I think Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20, I think when Isaiah was told by the Lord to go tell Hezekiah, you're going to die and not live. That sounds like that's pretty serious that God said that. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and read his stewardship report to God. God already knew it, of course. He wept. He told God he had been faithful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Before Isaiah could get out of the courtyard, God said to Isaiah, go back and tell Hezekiah, I renewed his life insurance policy and I've given him 15 more years. I just don't think that Hezekiah had a reserved posture when it came to worship. I think Hezekiah, as he's already been weeping before the renewal, I think he is weeping and worshiping. I think there is uh, unrestrained joy. I don't think he has to be prompted by the worship leader. All right, Hezekiah, you ought to stand now and give God praise. No, I think it happened instantaneously, automatically, without any coaxing, without anybody doing anything. It was in Hezekiah because he is giving back to God what God has given to him. Now this psalm is an individual song, and yet the worship is done in the midst of people as we've just got finished seeing in verses 17, 18, and 19. I will offer my sacrifice of thanksgiving in the midst of your people in the temple in Jerusalem. It's an I, me, and my psalm in the midst of the congregation. However, it becomes a soliloquy in verse 7. Self-conversation, where he's talking to himself. He says in verse 7, Be at rest, O my soul. He talked to himself. Soul, be at rest. Why? Verse 7, because the Lord has been good to you. My God. Rest, it's all right. Cool it. Get rid of your turbulence and experience tranquility because the Lord has been good to you. I like that word, good. That's fine. It's Richard uh, Lisher in his book, The End of Words, who says, in commenting on Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, and that context 
uh, where Moses asked God, who should I tell Pharaoh uh, sent me? And God says, tell him that I am that I am has sent you. And let's show in a very astute way notes. He says, I am that I am, which means there is a noun, I, and there is a verb, am. But there is no adjective. I am that I am. And Lysia says, the reason there's no adjective is that when you have a good noun, you don't need an adjective. And there is no noun better than God, the noun. How would you describe God? God is this, 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 this. It's always short. You can't ever contain him. In fact, sometimes the best you can do is give a wordless expression of praise to God. My mother is going to be with the Lord. She's one of the best cooks the Lord has ever, ever sent on planet Earth, as far as I'm concerned. But when you taste mama's cooking, you stop talking about this is delicious, this is delectable, this is delightful. Words are lost in expressions. Mm. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. And when you think about how good God has been to you and what God has done in your life, words are insignificant. Mm, 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 mm. Get to the place where you get lost in Him, and words are no longer necessary. This is a psalm in which trust in God is the apex of the song. He says all men are liars. He doesn't trust other people, ultimately. He doesn't trust himself because he realizes how insufficient and inadequate he is, but he trusts God. In verse 2, he says, he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on the name of the Lord. In verse 4, he says, I will call on the name of the Lord and say, Lord, save me. In verse 13, he says, I will call on the name of the Lord and lift up the cup of salvation. Verse 17, he says, I will call on the name of the Lord and offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's the Lord. Because time will come when faith is stripped to the bone and all your props and crutches are gone, your knowledge of God that he is good and is on the throne is the only thing that will keep you going. When health breaks down, that's a crutch. When good looks break down, that's a crutch. When there's a financial reversal, there's a crutch. When there's a re re relational uh, reversal, there's a crutch. And on and on and on. So that you don't have anything else to lean on except God, you will discover that he is enough. You will never know that Jesus is enough until you have nothing left but Jesus. And you will discover that he is your all-sufficient God. Well, Jesus is the personification of the psalm, actually. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. Remember, to God who owns everything and owes nothing. We as believers who own nothing and owe everything must render unto him in the spirit of Christ thanksgiving for all of his benefits. And here is Jesus personifying the song. We come to the 22nd chapter of Luke verse 19. He's at the Lord's supper table and he breaks bread and give thanks and says take and eat this is my body that was broken for you do this in remembrance of me and in the 11th chapter of John that 41st verse he stands before the sepulcher of Lazarus he looks up and says father I know that you hear me you've always heard me. He gave thanks. But then he says, for the benefit of those who are standing around, the implication is, let Lazarus as a whole 
come forth from the grave. And he just calls out and says, Lazarus, had he said, come forth. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have gotten up. Daniel would have gotten up because the dead will hear his voice and because he is the first fruits of the resurrection, they will come forth. But he said, no, that's the general resurrection. Let me specify who I want. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth because he has the power to do it. He gave thanks. And even on the cross, though that word is not used, his last word is, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirits. And therefore, brothers and sisters, your life and my life must be lives that give thanks to God. For we do not own anything, but we owe everything to God. No wonder Andre Crouch says, how shall I give thanks for the good you have done for me? Things so deserve deserve, yet you gave to prove your life for me. A voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. Oh, yes, yeah. to God be the glory. Yes, yeah. to God be the glory for the thing he has done. With his power, he has saved me. With his blood, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the thing he had done. Just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to thee. And if I gain anything, let it go to Calvary. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory. For the things he has done. For dying, for being raised from the dead by the Spirit of God, and to calling me to salvation and one day calling me to be with him forever. To God who owns everything and owes nothing. We as believers who own nothing and owe everything must render in the spirit of Christ to him thanksgiving for all of his benefits.